Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight in the Chaplain B. Barnes Reading Room for another lecture in our lecture series, Land Fear Live. My name is Jocelyn Leahy. I'm the Executive Director of the Watch Hill Conservancy. I wanted to do a couple of thanks this evening, and the first one goes out to Janice Sassy. This is our fourth season of Land Fear Live. Thank you for everyone who's joined us through over, over these years. This would not be possible without Janice. She spends so much time connecting with the presenters and coordinating with them to set up each of the lecture series. So thank you to all that you do, Janice. We really appreciate your hard work. And I want to thank the Conservancy Board of Directors as well. They're extremely supportive in our Land Fear Live program and all of our Conservancy programs and donate um, a generous amount of their time to making sure that this organization is led in the right direction. And I can't thank them enough for all that they contribute as well. And of course, Grant Simmons, thank you once again for giving us some great treats. There will also be some, uh, like I mentioned, refreshments tomorrow afternoon as well. And finally, I want to thank Dr. Ludis for joining us this evening. I'm looking forward to your uh, presentation. You know, it's such a timely matter, and I hope we all walk away a little bit more wiser uh, given the topic. And uh, to introduce Dr. Ludis, Pete August, our Napa Tree Science Advisor Chair and Conservancy Vice President. Thanks, Pete. Thank you, Jocelyn. You know, it seems like every day we read of yet another example of using the internet to spread false information. It might be ransomware attacks on businesses and government agencies, or malicious disruption of critical services, such, such as the attack on the Microsoft email server system earlier in the year. This evening's speaker, speaker, Dr. James Ludis, is an internationally recognized expert in matters of cybersecurity and national security. He is the executive director of the Pell Center for International Relations and Public Policy located at Salve Regina University. Dr. Ludis has been a leader in this field for a long time. Some of his previous posts include being the executive director of the American Security Project, a think tank in Washington, D.C., focused on educating the public on a broad range of national security issues. He was a member of then-president-elect Obama's transition team, where working inside the Department of Defense, um, his mission was to identify critical issues that would need to be tackled by the Obama administration. He served for a period as a legislative assistant to Sen Senator John Kerry, uh, uh, specializing in issues of defense and foreign policy, and he's currently the editor-in-chief of National Security S Studies Quarterly, a defense and national security, uh, security journal. He received his PhD from Georgetown University and is the author or editor of three recent books on national security. Please join me in welcoming Dr. James Lucas. Thank you very much. Hello, folks. Uh, I am Jim Lutis. It's my real pleasure to be with everybody tonight. I want to thank Pete for that wonderful introduction. It makes me wish that my parents had been here. I think uh, my dad would have been proud, and my mom probably would have believed him. Um, I've, there's a lot that I want to run through tonight, uh, but I do want to thank the Conservancy for uh, organizing this whole series and for having me here tonight. Uh, 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 Janice and, uh, uh, oh, help me. Uh, Jocelyn, thank you, and Deborah, thank you so much for having me here tonight. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity. I, I'm grateful to all of you for coming out on a summer night to listen to me talk about disinformation. I'm, hopefully, I'm going to make it worth your while. So there is a ton that we want to get through. And I'm, I know that people have dinner reservations and places you want to be. Uh, so I'll do this as efficiently and as quickly as I possibly can. Uh, if I'm going too fast, or you're like, wait a minute, what was that? Stop me. Raise your hand. I'll be happy to take questions as we go. And we'll save some time at the end as well. I'm going to quickly sort of tell you about how I got into this set of issues, because uh, it will provide some context and it'll also maybe alert you to some biases that I might have in talking about these things. 
Um, we'll spend a little time talking about what is political warfare. Um, and I'll get into more of that in a second. Uh, we're going to talk mostly about Russia tonight. Uh, they are pioneers in this space. Uh, they've been active since before the Soviet Union. Uh, and they've been active since the Soviet Union. Um, we will talk a little bit about public health and coronavirus, because guess what? People are active on that issue in the disinformation space internationally. Uh, and that it's, it has an impact on, on everything that we've been dealing with in the last year. We'll pull it all together uh, and, and in, in, again, about 50 minutes. Uh, and I'll be happy to take Q&A either throughout or at the end as well. Um, so the first thing you need to know about me is that I was a Cold War kid, which means that I was raised on the three Bs. And the first B, of course, is James Bond. The second B is Boris and Natasha. And the third B is Rocky Balboa. Now, I tell you all of that because it's important to understand that growing up for me, the Soviets, also the Russians, they were the bad guys, right? I expected to spend my career as a Sovietologist at the CIA looking at pictures like this and trying to figure out who is standing next to whom on top of Lenin's tomb at the May Day Parade. Because if you knew who was standing next to whom, you would know who was rising in power and who was falling in power. I thought that would be a pretty good job. So I went to Providence College, and I studied uh, history, and I studied modern languages. And in the middle of my junior year, my career plans went complete poof, because the Soviet Union ceased to exist. Well, so plan B, I was going to go to Georgetown anyways, get myself a, a doctorate in history. Not because Jack Ryan did it in the Tom Clancy novels, but because <laughs> I wanted to understand history. I wanted to work at that fulcrum of, of, of politics and policy. And I thought the people who impressed me were the people who knew history. So I got a PhD in history at Georgetown University. Uh, and then I spent the next mm, almost two decades working on national security and policy issues, uh, principally in the Democratic Party. I spent time in the Department of Defense, as Pete said, uh, uh, in the Obama administration. And what I found was um, that what I had written my dissertation about, America's use of disinformation in the Cold War and America's use of political warfare in the Cold War, nobody cared about. It didn't help me meet girls. It didn't help me get a job. It was really seemed for a very long time that this was not the best use of my time. Then a funny thing happened. In the summer of 2016, I started to notice that things that I had written about in my dissertation suddenly seemed very relevant again. There were tactics and tricks that uh, I really hadn't thought about in 15, 16, 17 years that were playing out on my social media feed, that were playing out uh, in the conversation that we were having as a nation. So before Election Day 2016, I wrote an article for a policy journal called War on the Rocks. I basically, this is great. I dusted off all of my old dissertation notes. I actually leafed through those, that, those documents again and, and, and realized America's Cold War strategy, devised by the Truman administration, refined by the Eisenhower administration, was essentially to exploit the rot within the Soviet Union to lay bare all of the things that were wrong within Soviet society and then let people figure it out for themselves. And so the article that I published before Election Day 2016 was, the Russians read our Cold War playbook. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. 2017, with a great collaborator of mine, uh, old friend Mark Jacobson, we hosted a, a, a conference in Newport um, where we tried to make sense of what we had just seen happen. Um, we brought together uh, technologists, uh, uh, Russian area experts, um, media experts, and we really tried to parse through what had happened. And we produced a report, Shatter the House of Mirrors, uh, which is substantially shorter than any of the investigations that have happened since. But in 2017, we, we, told, we told our readers what had happened. And it has uh, withstood the test of time. So, a couple of key considerations. What did we ultimately conclude? Well, Russia's engaged in a well-financed and determined effort to undermine democratic political institutions in the West. And they're doing that uh, because they want to remove uh, any restrictions on Russia's own ability to operate domestically, but also internationally. 
There's some motivation there that stems from the collapse of the Soviet Union and what they believe the West's hand was uh, in that. Um, and they want to see uh, uh, diminished cohesion within Western democracies, but also within international institutions that exclude Russia. So principally there, we're talking about the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, and the European Union. And finally, the principal means that Russia is using to achieve these ends is something that I call political warfare. You might hear it called information warfare. You might hear it called computational propaganda. There are a whole host of things that they're using, but it's essentially using information as a weapon to try to achieve political ends, okay? So, what is war? So I asked that question in my class, and students all sort of do this. They don't want to look at me. They try to avoid making eye contact. This is not a philosophical question. What is war is one of those timeless questions that uh, historians and, and, and philosophers and strategists have grappled with uh, from the dawn of time. A reasonable definition is that war is political violence between two or more states. Political violence between two or more states. The only problem with that definition is that in our lifetimes, we can think of at least two examples of things we called wars that don't necessarily fit that definition. So we had, a war, we, had the, we had the Cold War, which certainly was between two or more states, but it was not really defined and, and, and resolved on a battlefield somewhere, right? On a traditional battlefield. And then, of course, we had the War on Terror, which certainly had violence, but it wasn't between two or more states. So that definition doesn't really work for us. The US military is really, really good at the operational art of war. If you believe that war is about breaking the other side's ability to fight, their organization, their military, we were really good at that, right? Really, really good at that. That's a scene from the so-called Highway of Death in 1991. That's 30-year-old technology that obliterated Iraqi forces fleeing north out of Kuwait City, right? That was an amazing military accomplishment. But 10 years later, American troops are back in the city of Fallujah for the third time trying to put down an insurgency because while we could shatter that army, wars are not won by breaking organizations. They're won by breaking will. That handsome man is uh, Karl von Clausewitz, the classic uh, Prussian uh, military strategist. And he said, basically, if you want to win a war, you don't break the other side's army. You don't break the, uh, the, the military organization. You break the willpower. You break the will of the enemy population. So in the Second World War, we did that pretty much by obliterating the industrial heartland of Europe and Asia. That's pretty much the way World War II was won. And that's an effective way, if you're willing to commit that kind to that, to that kind of uh, a fighting and destruction, you can achieve the breaking of will through that. But if the war ends with one bomb that can destroy an entire city, and then your adversaries get that same bomb, the prospect of fighting some future war is kind of terrifying. And so strategists at the end of the Second World War realized that they needed to come up with another set of tools to bend other wills to, to your own preferred outcome without necessarily having to go to nuclear war. And so the term that evolved was Cold War. Notice that's lowercase c, lowercase w. When I'm not referring to the historic epic here, the Cold War. Right? It's going to be a Netflix movie next year. Wait for it. The Cold War. No, I'm talking about Cold War, the opposite of hot war. The, 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 achieving, the achievement of political ends internationally through means other than the use of force. And that is principally what the United States sought to do in the Cold War. We sought to persuade Eastern Europeans, the people in Asia, the people in Latin America, the people in uh, Africa, that what the West offered was better than what the Soviets offered. Now, interesting, this is not just an American perspective. This is exactly what the Soviets were trying to do, too. They were using the same set of tools. Uh, Oleg Kalugin was a high-ranking KGB defector. The Soviets had something called active measures. 
active measures to weaken the West, to drive wedges in the Western community of alliances of all sorts, particularly NATO, to sow discord among allies, to weaken the United States in the eyes of the people, Europe, Asia, Africa, Latin America, so on and so forth. Cold War was an informational contest. And that is largely what we see here today. So Vladimir Putin is the president of uh, Russia. Uh, but in the Cold War, he was a KGB officer. And he was trained and well-versed in the kinds of tactics that we're going to talk about here tonight. By 1991, he was the head of the FSB, which was uh, the Russian Federation's Foreign Intelligence Service. And then, of course, he's had two different stints as president. He, his objectives in all of this are, again, to create a free hand for Russia domestically and internationally. He wants to eliminate institutions that exclude Russia. Uh, he wants to eliminate sanctions on the Russian economy. He wants to weaken the political cohesion of Russia's adversaries, the stuff that keeps uh, 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 either alliances or, uh, or complex uh, adversarial states together. Um, Ideologically, he favors relationships with individuals rather than between institutions. We could, we could, we could dive deep on that, because that sort of cuts to the quick of what Western liberalism actually means. But we'll, we can, we'll, we'll save that for another time, maybe. But this gentleman is Valery Gerasimov, and he is the chief of the Russian general staff. 2013, in a very obscure military technical journal in Russia, he published an article. And I got to get this quote right. He basically conceded that Russia can't match the United States or the West in terms of military technology or military budgets. But, he said, that Russia could achieve strategic effects, including, quote, the use of technologies for influencing state structures and the population with the help of information networks. The help of information networks. In 2013, that means something different than in 2000 and, or excuse me, than in 1968. In 2013, we're talking about Twitter. We're talking about Facebook. We're talking about social media. And that's going to be a big part of what we talk about here. So if we're talking about political warfare, the use of uh, information to persuade, on the spectrum of conflict, so nuclear war is somewhere over here, right? Like big bad nuclear war is somewhere over here. Political warfare is down at the low end of this gray zone area, right? That's where political warfare takes place. What General Gerasimov said, what American and Soviet strategists throughout the Cold War believed was that you could achieve the same strategic objectives that you thought about with nuclear weapons, with political warfare, at, much greater le at a much diminished cost but you could still achieve the same things. So let me talk to you about a couple examples of this. 1959, this is a legitimate false flag operation. 1959, the Soviet Union was very concerned that West Germany was going to join NATO's unified military command. So all of that personnel, all of that armor, all of that potential still in West Germany was going to join NATO. The Soviets didn't like that. They didn't like that one bit. So they sent three intelligence officers across the border from East Germany into West Germany, into one city. And they spray painted swastikas, a, a symbol that had been, pardon the expression, verboten in, 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 in Germany after the end of the war on three buildings that had formerly been part of the Jewish community. The simple message that the Soviets were trying to say to anybody who would listen you can't trust the West Germans because the Nazis are not gone. The interesting thing is that there, if you read the history of the denazification process in Germany, there are a period of waves in the 1950s and 1960s. They're called swastika waves, where there would be suddenly all of this graffiti popping up all over the country. It was swastikas. In this particular case, this was all triggered by the Soviet Union an intelligence operation. And those swastikas, once that taboo was broken, started popping up in other places. And the Soviets didn't do that. But the taboo had been broken. And that, this particular wave culminated in New York City, in, a, in the harbor in New York. Uh, but those swastikas marched right, right across the European continent 
made it all the way to New York. All right, so that's a real false flag operation. And what the Soviets were doing was they were exploiting a lingering sensitivity within German society, within the Western alliances, right? Can you really trust the Germans? Can you really trust the Germans? Interestingly, interestingly, in 1949, the CIA publishes their first field manual. And they say here, look, exploit existing issues. The skilled operator very rarely attempts to make a new fissure in the armor of the enemy's morale. He selects with care weaknesses which already exist and insists upon them with artful suggestion and reminder. It's a little bit like a musician. You find a theme and you repeat it and then you move on to the next and then you come back to that theme just to remind people how lovely that was, right? Artful, what did it say? Skillful, uh, artful suggestion and reminder. This is 1949. So I'm gonna ask you a, a, a question. If you wanted to pick an issue, a lingering, festering issue in American society to exploit, to divide us. Racism. Have you, have you heard this before? Have you been to here before? Uh, 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 my friend in the front row here said uh, racism. So yes, if you were gonna pick an issue to exploit in the United States, you would pick racism. And the fact of the matter is the Russians and before them the Soviets have a really long history doing this. So this group of gentlemen here are known as the Scottsboro Boys. In 1931, uh, this group of nine African-American men were accused of gang raping uh, three white women on a train in the South. Uh, they were nearly lynched uh, when the train came to an end. Uh, there were three trials. After the second trial, one of the women uh, uh, recanted and said, we made the story up, it never happened. Uh, but these men were uh, convicted uh, and put in prison uh, for a large portion of their lives. This became a cause celeb of the Soviet Union. They loved to remind the United States of our racist ways, uh, of the great injustices done to the African American community. I would tell you that uh, all that may be true, the Soviet Union was not acting out of any sense of real uh, indignity or anger or outrage about the plight of the Scottsboro Boys. They recognized the divisive issue when they could find one, and they were trying to exploit it. Okay? So two things, this is important to remember, two things can be true simultaneously. Racism is a long-standing problem in the United States, and our adversaries are going to exploit it. And so how do you reconcile that? Well, that's going to get us into 2016. This is some, some propaganda that the, that the Soviets created for their own domestic consumption. Um, this is a, uh, a, a, a Cyrillic uh, alliteration of Wall Street. Uh, you see the, the dog of an American policeman, you know, clearly with, with, a, with a chastened Statue of Liberty looking downtrodden and, and sort of uh, written here. But these are this, the Svoboda pa Amerikansky across the bottom is Freedom American style. And so in that top left corner, uh, you see uh, freedom of the press with, with the words lies and slander on the ducks that are flying out of the, uh, out of the, out of the bullhorn. Uh, in the bottom left, you see freedom of opinions where you're being told what to think by some corporate master. Uh, the bottom right is the freedom of gatherings and meetings where the, the union protesters are being broken up by the police. And that top right corner is freedom of identity, which depicts the lynching of the Ku Klux Klan. That's the image of the United States that the Soviet Union projected to their own citizens. To the rest of the world, the image that they projected to the United States is probably best captured by the fake letter they wrote to the United Nations. Um, this is a, uh, basically all of the Asian delegates, uh, delegations and African delegations in 1961, got, excuse me, November of 1960, uh, got a letter signed by the Ku Klux Klan um, with some of the most vile racist epithets you can imagine uh, thrown at these people. Um, and again, signed by the Ku Klux Klan, but it wasn't signed by the KKK, it was actually written by the KGB. But they got this story in the New York Times and they got some members of the uh, United Nations to read the full content of that letter into the official record of the United Nations, just to underscore how welcoming the United States was to delegates around the world, All right? So they're using race. They're coming back to this issue again and again and again. Martin Luther King Jr. was somebody that the Soviet Union hated. They hated him because 
he did not preach racial animosity. He preached racial reconciliation. The Soviet Union much favored a group of, let's say, more animated, uh, uh, more uh, prone to violence uh, activists. Um, Martin Luther King was not helpful to them. So if you go back and you look at the Soviet-controlled newspapers operating in the West at that time, Martin Luther King is kind of a nuisance. They don't want to pay much attention to him. Um, they uh, start telling stories about him, slandering him, uh, calling him not much more than an Uncle Tom. Um, they re what they really wanted to see was a race war in the United States. And MLK wasn't going to get them there until he was murdered. And then on a dime, those same newspapers lionized him. Here's this great hero, martyred, martyred for the cause. Because again, what the Soviets wanted to do was to drive a deep stake of division into the United States, into our politics, and into our society. Um, so that brings us to 2016. So there were four things that the Russians did in 2016. The first is they used their military intelligence services to boost the candidacy of Donald Trump. I'd be happy to discuss that at length with anybody if they want to get into it in the Q&A. But this has been documented in a whole range of court filings and, and other uh, independent investigations. The, the, if you want to just look at sort of a quick prima facie evidence of it, it's the timing of the first WikiLeaks dump and the Access Hollywood video. Um, they used military intelligence services to undermine the candidacy of Hillary Clinton. Um, if you take a look at the Podesta emails, uh, and how those were dribbled out in drips and drabs. Um, that was clearly intended to do damage, to exploit the rot existing within American politics, right? Again, go back to what I said before. The stuff that we saw, the, 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 the sordid underbelly of American politics, it's not pretty for anyone. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the, Soviet, or the Russians weren't exploiting it. Third point, they used military intelligence services to probe election infrastructure. They actually were getting into the engineering of American politics to see how they could raise uncertainty about the outcome of the election. Yeah. How did release of the Hollywood Access, Access Hollywood tape boost the candidacy of Donald Trump? It did it. it, it that was the Access Hollywood video went live that morning. And by the end of the day, the, the WikiLeaks stump was taking place. So it basically knocked that story off the news. That happened the same day? Same day. <clears throat> within hours. So one more point about what the, what the Russians did in 2016. They used social media troll farms to micro-target Americans with divisive messages. So this nondescript building in St. Petersburg, Russia, uh, is the home of the Internet Research Agency. In 2015, 2015, an, uh, a journalist by the name of Adrian Chen wrote a profile about this, this, this enterprise. Uh, and in doing so, he was able to figure out a number of accounts that were managed by this institution in St. Petersburg, Russia. Later that year, he came to realize that um, that list of trolls that he had been tracking on social media had suddenly become conservative Americans. They had been Europeans. They had been uh, Africans. They had been literally operating all over the world. But those accounts had been turned to American politics by the end of 2015. And he wrote another story about this. He said, look, I don't know what's going on here, but all of these accounts that I know are operated by the Internet Research Agency are now treating, tweeting like they're conservative Americans. So one of the accounts that they created was something called Blacktivist. Blacktivist purported to be uh, uh, upset about police brutality against African Americans. And posted a steady diet of videos and stories and still images of, Amer of American police officers uh, being physically rough or violent uh, with, um, with African American men. Um, Blacktivist had 360,000 followers on Facebook, which at the time was larger than the actual legitimate Black Lives Matters account. But Blacktivist was operated out of the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, Russia. Um, they had a whole host of provocative things that they should say, uh, that they would say. Um, again, uh, not passing judgment about whether or not this is true. It's being, it's, it's being used to exploit divisions in American society. Um, 
they got discovered, uh, blacktivists got discovered, because he tried to organize, or they tried to organize, uh, an anniversary on the death of Freddie Gray's, on, on the anniversary of Freddie Gray's death in, in Baltimore. And the family reached out and said, hey, who are you? Uh, and they said, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm a sympathetic friend. Uh, and in one of those messages, they actually left on the geotagging, and it said St. Petersburg, Russia. And so there was, that's when the, it began to fall apart. The Internet Research Agency went so far as to use Pokemon Go. I don't know if you guys remember this, this little craze that maybe your, your kids or your grandkids had a few years ago. But Pokemon Go, you'd use your phone, there was an app, and you would go to these different places and you would find the Pokemon characters, and you would try to collect them all. Well, the Russians on, uh, on, on a different social media platform posted a game, and they would give you the geo coordinates of different murders of different African American men by different police uh, forces in the United States, and send you to them and say, there's a Pokemon there, get the Pokemon at that location, take your picture with it, and send it to us, and you could win a $100 Amazon gift card. All right? So they are literally exploiting America's pop culture, America's technology, America's social media to try to, to, try to divide America further on a variety of issues. So these are some of the ads that they created in the, in the, in the 2016 campaign. One of the tells for me is a very sophisticated matter of forensics is they paid for it in Russian rubles. Should have been a tell. Should have been a tell. Um, but this is a, would appear to be um, uh, 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 a post that is, um, I don't know if you guys know the Westboro Baptist Church, but when I was working on the Hill, I used to go to funerals for American service members. And the Westboro Baptist Church would show up and they would protest. Um, they would protest the fallen soldiers. Uh, and it's some of the most offensive stuff I've ever seen. So this is, purports to be from, a, from an LGBT organization uh, calling out the Westboro Baptist Church. They're going to have a counter protest uh, of the Westboro Baptist Church. Um, because the Westboro Baptist Church said that American soldiers were dying because America was too nice to members of the homosexual community. That was their, their, their basic thrust. So that was the target. But what, really what they're trying to do is they're trying to trigger people. They're trying to stoke those divisions and get you to get amped up and angry at, oh my God, they're really doing this. Um, and we can run through a whole cycle of these things. So this is about immigration. It appears, again, this is called from something called the heart of Texas. It's designed to stoke divisions around immigration as an issue. Uh, they love this issue of secession of American states. So here is one from October 26th of 2016. You might remember that people thought Hillary was going to run. They were stoking Texans to get ready to secede if she were to actually win. Thing is that the campaign didn't stop with the American campaign. So USA Today did a series of studies uh, in, in early 2017. Race-related ads actually increased as a percentage of the ads that the Russians were buying on social media after Election Day. The ads that they principally were buying after Election Day were principally focused on immigration, and on tensions within the Latino, Latinx, and Hispanic communities in the United States. Again, pick the issue that is sensitive in American public life and exploit it. Go back to it again and again and again. All right, so these are just, I'll give you six different examples. I'll let you look at this yourselves. But basically, uh, we get everything from immigration to uh, police officers wearing hijabs uh, to uh, 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 immigration. The clever thing about this is that you look at that and you say, well, clearly that's appealing to uh, sort of uh, uh, liberal, like this is, this is good for liberals, right? It's intended to trigger people who are sensitive to these issues. So if you care about immigration, you're going to be mad about this. If you care about, if you're worried about uh, uh, the war on terror, you're going to be upset about some of these. All of these things, again, are just going back to hot button issues and pressing them on social media over and over and over again. I got like hours worth of this stuff, and in the interest of time, I'm going to skip through some of these. Um, <laughs> well, let me, let me give you, this, this, is, this is the most recent one that I have, and it's from this spring. So you remember that there was a, a murder. Uh, and I got, first I want to say apologize. There's some four-letter words in this, OK? This is collected. This is a real thing that actually happened. Um, 
there were murders in a number of, uh, targeting a number of uh, Asian Americans in spas and salons uh, in the first part of this year. Uh, in April, this letter appeared on social media, and it basically tells people to go back to where you came from and calls them a bunch of nasty names. Um, but there is a linguistic telling that makes me think that actually um, it might not be what it appears to be. So uh, one of the curiosities about the Russian language is that there's no definitive article. So if I say I'm gonna go to the hospital, the definitive article there is the word the. Russians don't have a definitive article in their language. So when you see something in social media that says, I have to go to hospital, well, it's a tell that perhaps the person who originally wrote that isn't used to using the definitive article. That very last line, get the bleep out of US, it doesn't sound to me like a native, speaking, a native English speaker, right? So somebody's trying to stoke resentment and anger with this letter that's just from this year. Other things that we've seen in the last couple of years, Russia has cultivated extensive ties to American extremists. Um, remember the Unite the Right rally in, uh, in, in, uh, in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, this is actually before that. This is from May, so a couple months before the rally where the woman died, um, where the uh, organizers showed up, and among the things that they chanted was, Russia is our friend. I don't know what that means exactly, but Russia is our friend. We know what happened in Charlottesville later. Um, but they were back a couple months after the Charlottesville riots, and again, they were surrounding the, the statue of Robert E. Lee, and they were chanting, among other things, Russia is our friend. Now, that's a really an interesting refrain to hear from American right-wing activists, um, but it's worth exploring because it turns out that Russia, and including the Russian intelligence services under Vladimir Putin, have very carefully cultivated relationships with, let's call them separatists, all over the world. Uh, and in the case of American traditionalists, uh, they have cultivated the idea that Vladimir Putin, as the Russian president, is the last best hope of white European Christendom. So, among other things, Moscow has hosted conferences for separatist movements from Texas and California and Hawaii and Puerto Rico and uh, Scotland and, uh, well, it goes on and on around the world. Um, it was, a lot of this goes hand in hand with the secessionist social media that we see coming from Russia, whether it's from Texas or California. Interesting thing about Yes California, which was a, a, a furtive California secessionist movement that was teed up uh, in the aftermath of 2016. So remember, two things were going on, right? Donald Trump was gonna win, they said, Texas, get ready, or excuse me, if Hillary Clinton was gonna win, Texas, get ready to secede. Same time, they're teeing up California. Donald Trump wins, California, get ready to secede. Because the objective here is to divide Americans amongst ourselves. So Yes California is an interesting organization. It was created by this, among others, this gentleman, a man by the name of Louis Marinelli, a 30-year-old former English teacher uh, who was president of the Yes California movement. And when he started the, 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 the petition, the most recent petition campaign to get California secession on the ballot in California, he was living in Russia. <laughs> Interestingly, He's not, he was, he was in Russia because he was married to his Russian bride. This is a recurring theme that we're gonna see again and again. This guy here, Richard Spencer, uh, was uh, by all accounts, uh, uh, he, if you wanna call him a neo-Nazi or if you wanna call him a, a hard right American activist. Um, he was the leader of the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. Uh, he's organized all of those protests around the statue uh, to Robert E. Lee. Um, He's the one leading the chance of Russia is our friend. His wife, who's very lovely, uh, is Russian-born Nina Kuprianova. Uh, now, they're separated now. I think the divorce might be finalized. Um, but uh, th th his wife, again, was a, he had another Russian wife. Now, the interesting thing about his Russian wife is that she was the translator and spokesperson for this gentleman, Alexander Dugan. 
Alexander Dugan is as unsavory a character as you're going to find pretty much anywhere. He is an out and out fascist. He believes that politicians and politics should be used to spur the end times by some great conflict between East and West. Uh, he believes American liberalism. He's not talking about conservative and you know, liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans. He's talking about freedom and free institutions and courts and the rule of law. American liberalism must be destroyed. He's written books about it. He has done lectures at American universities about destroying uh, the American Republic. Um, and his principal American translator and spokesperson was married to Richard Spencer, the head of the Unite the Right movement. So um, this is from June 2018. If you know these folks, Lauren Southern, who's a Canadian uh, uh, conservative activist. She's the blonde in the middle. And Brittany Pettibone is the one on the right. And here they are visiting with uh, Alexander Dugan uh, in Russia, uh, trying to get his take on American politics. So I, there's, there's a lot of ground that we've covered. I know you're saying, wait a minute, are you for real? Could this possibly be true? And let me just give you a couple of quick little points on this. So MIT got this wrong, right? They said big data is going to save democracy. Well, except, <laughs> turns out, that big data, particularly in the form of the data that's gathered by social media companies, is really we've, what we've created are precision-guided munitions of the mind, where we can figure out who do we want to talk to, what's going to provoke an emotional response in, those, in that person, and then we can exploit it. So Facebook, that's their business model. They want you to buy Tide because Tide feels good, right? or you're mad at dawn, whatever, right? That is the entire business model of social media companies. And so as they develop psychographic profiles of every one of us who uses these platforms, they know what's going to trigger us, and they sell that to marketers. So this is a, uh, an article published in the um, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, where there were 800,000 of us unwitting subjects of a Facebook uh, uh, social engineering experiment. They wanted to know whether or not emotional contagion could happen on a social media platform. Now, emotional contagion is a well-documented and well-understood phenomena in psychiatry. It is basically that someone comes in and if they have a very intense emotional expression, it's going to cloud the entire room, right? I've got some cousins like this, right? They come in, it's bad news for everybody. What Facebook found is that you can actually spread emotional contagion through social media. So before they did this, you could either give something a thumbs up or not on Facebook. After they did the study, now you can like, you can love, you can cry, you can laugh. Right? There are five different things now that you can respond to on, social, on Facebook because now they have greater specificity about you. So this is all interesting except for the fact that there are now metrics. Uh, the University of Tennessee at Knoxville took a look at the ads that we know were run by Russian internet uh, uh, troll farms, the Internet Research Agency, to see how those activities, or whether those activities, predicted any changes in American politics, particularly in polling data. Bottom line here is that approximately every 25,000 retweets of a, treat, of a tweet that originated from the Internet Research Agency produced a 1% gain for candidate Trump. 25,000 retweets, 1% gain. So one of the questions that we have to ask is, and this is, this is raised by uh, Oxford University's computational propaganda program. They took a look at Twitter activity in Michigan uh, prior to and around Election Day 2016. And they will be the first to tell you they don't know what they saw. But there was such an influx, such an incredible influx of political Twitter activity from, sus from suspected accounts that it gave them reason to question whether or not, whether, it wasn't whether or not the polls had been hacked, it's whether or not our minds had been hacked. Right? So 25,000 retweets, 1% gain. Election results moved 6.23% from the final poll to the final results on election day. Again, that 1% gain of, uh, predicted by the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. 
there are, you would need 155,000 tweets to produce a 6.23% swing. And the week before election day, there are somewhere between uh, 1.1 million and 13.8 million tweets about the 2016 election in Russia. We do not have the specificity to say, to, to cipher through the noise to signal ratio in this, but there are a lot of people that are spending their times right now trying to understand, did the Russians know how to put their finger on the scale just enough to move the needle without it ever being noticed? That's something that we need to try to understand as, as Americans because we care about ultimately the faith in our democracy. Russia at the same time was hacking uh, uh, the uh, election uh, websites and the Secretary of State's uh, offices and election systems in all 50 states. Not 15 states, not 18 states, all 50 states. And in a couple of cases, the investigators think that the Russians basically put their hand over the mouse and put their hand right there just long enough for the folks doing the, the, the cybersecurity on the, on the blue side of the fence to see them, to know that they were there before they would vanish from the systems. Well, what are you doing there? Well, you're trying to undermine confidence in the integrity of American elections. At the same time that they were doing that, at the same time that they were feeding all 50 states, they were mounting a campaign on social media. This is from an account called Tennessee GOP, right? except it's not the official Tennessee GOP account. They, they build themselves as the unofficial Tennessee GOP account. And they put out this one. Thousands of names changed on voter rolls in Indiana. Police investigating. Hashtag voter fraud. Right? This is in uh, October of 2016. So at the same time that their intelligence services are hacking America's election systems, and letting people know that, hey, we could change stuff if we wanted to, they're saying on social media, yeah, names have been changed. This is an active measure. This is creating a reality, popularizing it, getting people to pay attention to it, and then just walking away, leaving people uncertain what just happened. Is it real? Can we be confident in our elections? So, I could go on and on. There are, are, are movements all over the United, all over the world that, that the Russians are supporting, nationalist and, and uh, populist anti-system parties in Europe, uh, in France, in Greece, in Italy, in Hungary, uh, in Austria. Um, the, the actual documented evidence of Russian influence campaigns since just 2014, it's just since 2014, cover basically every major election in the West, including Brexit. Uh, including the Scottish independence vote, including all three American elections. Um, this is real. This is happening. Well, wasn't it going both ways, you were saying, that Russia provokes this side and then they provoke this yeah. side? I mean, because clearly they didn't want Trump to be president because... We can talk about that. Thing. We can talk about that. So let me say one last quick thing. The other thing that they've been doing now, especially in the last two years, is they've been exploiting America's public, the world's public health crisis. And they've been doing this principally by sowing doubt about vaccines. So um, I can run through the whole history of what they did on HIV AIDS, what they did on Ebola, what they did on uh, the swine flu. But since 2014, they have been stoking, so this is before the pandemic, they've been stoking both sides of the vaccine debate, both the anti-vaxxers and the pro-vaxxers. And this has been documented, uh, again, in the American Journal of Public Health by some researchers down at Johns Hopkins University where they were able to see these accounts that we know were operated by the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, Russia, stoking the debate on both sides, both for pro-vaccine and anti-vaccine. And since the pandemic began, they have undermined confidence specifically in the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines and the Johnson & Johnson vaccines, all while trying to push their own Sputnik V vaccine from Russia. So this is an ongoing thing. What I would say in terms of what can we do about it as citizens, well, number one, lower the temperature in the room, right? When somebody wants to have a real heated debate about politics, it's not what politics is supposed to be about. Politics is about solving problems and finding ways to make uh, this land work for everybody, right? So, so when people want to get into a real heated debate and call each other names, just don't engage in it. The other thing we need to do, though, is we all need to be good, skeptical, critical thinkers. 
about the stuff that we see on social media. And if we see something and it fires us up, and man, I'm going to tweet that out because, man, that makes me feel good, it's exactly what they want you to do. So stop, think, assess, hey, who's saying this? Do they actually know what, they talk, what they're talking about? Do they have another agenda? And if you can't answer any of those questions clearly, don't send the tweet. I will stop it at that point. I could talk all night about this stuff, but I'm happy to take some questions. I know Pete's going to moderate. <laughs>